This is going to be Genesis chapter 10, and I'm going to talk to you about how people are interested in people. This chapter is about the genealogy of Noah. People overlook this chapter as one of the boring chapters in the scriptures. This is because there's such a long list of names. They say to themselves, why is this even in the Bible? Why do I have to read this long list of names? But think about it for a second. What are people interested in? Other people. This is why they have People Magazine. This is why they sit around at work on the phone and with the other co-workers talking about what? Other people. This is why women love soap operas. They can be nosing in all these people's lives even though they aren't even real people's lives. Why do you think Facebook is so popular? Because people are interested in people. This chapter is about the sons of Noah, which are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They are the daddies of all these people mentioned. They are really everybody's daddy. We all came from these three men. You say, well, I don't need to know who everybody's daddy is. Well, all the men at work, at one time or another, have asked me, who's your daddy? They say, now, who was your mother again? And I tell them, and they say, oh, yeah, I went to school with her, and her brother is so-and-so. They say, well, I didn't know that was your uncle. And who was your sister? People are interested in people. That's who they ask me about. Who was your daddy? Who's your father? They want to know who your mom is. They want to know who your dad is. So how come, why is it when we get to the Bible and God's telling us who was the daddy of who and who's the son of who, we say, oh, this is boring. Well, people are interested in people, and I think it's interesting to know whose daddy was who and how long they lived. But this chapter shows you the history of who's who and where they ended up settling at. You see, Noah and his sons just got off the, had just gotten off the ark. There was nobody except them, and they had to populate the planet. So what you have in, Gen in Genesis 10 is you have Noah's three sons and they're going to populate the planet and it's telling you who their kids are that they have. And this chapter also shows you how good that God is at keeping record of things. But here's a quick breakdown of the chapter. And if you can get this breakdown right here of the chapter, it'll really help you with the chapter. In verses 2 through 5, it's going to show you the sons of Japheth. So you can like put brackets around that and put sons of Japheth. In 6 through 20, it's going to show you the sons of Ham. So you can put brackets around that and put the sons of Ham. 21 through 32 shows you the sons of Shem. So write that, that down. Break it down like that and it's going to be a lot easier. Something else to keep in mind is that what's ha what's what it's telling you about in Genesis 10... It's telling you about things that are actually going to happen after chapter 11. Because look at Genesis 10, 5. It says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Then Genesis 10, 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Genesis 10.32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations. By these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So notice that this is giving account of when the people were divided by their families, tongues, and in their nations. And see, in chapter 11, you have the Tower of Babel, and this is where God actually came down to confound their language. In chapter 11, and verse 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And then in verse 7 and 8 it says, Go to, let us go down. And there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So Genesis 10 seems to be describing the dividing of people throughout the whole earth that took place after the Tower of Babel. But it's in chapter 10, which comes before chapter 11. That's just how it's wrote. And there's many movies, TV shows, books that you've probably seen in your lifetime that tell about a future event that took place after 
uh, an event that happens later in the book. All right, now let's start looking at each verse. Genesis 10.1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. So Noah's three sons are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They don't seem to have had any children themselves on the ark. Their sons were born after the flood, it says. So Shem is Asiatic, Ham is African, and Japheth European. Now let's talk about how people are interested in people. The first thing is, for one thing, they have children. The average person wants to get married. They don't want to be alone. They want to get a wife. And they want to have children. They want to have more people. When you're raising a child, a good portion of your life is dedicated to that little person. And this is why it, it, it's not so ridiculous that God writes down the children of these three sons of Noah. God is interested in his children. You're interested in your children and their lives. God's interested in his children and their lives. Now, not everybody is a child of God, but everybody is God's creatures. God made everybody. So it makes sense that God's interested in what everybody's doing. All right, in 2 through 5, verses 2 through 5, you got the sons of Japheth. Genesis 10, 2, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Ripheth, and Tagarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tirshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Now here it looks like in Genesis 10, 5, that Gentiles is just the sons of Japheth, but actually, in the New Testament, if you look there, in 1 Corinthians, it says, Give none offense to the Jew, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So in the New Testament, it seems to plainly show you that Gentiles is everyone that's not a Jew and not the church. So it's more than just the sons of Japheth. Then in 6 through 7, you got the sons of Ham. And it says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Foot, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabtika, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. So these guys are having children. They're being fruitful and multiplying, replenishing the earth. What makes you think that people are interested in people? Well, for one thing, they don't want to be alone, they get married. They have children. They're interested in their children. So it would make sense that God is interested in the people that he's created. It makes sense that he would. Why, why would he write this all down? Because he's interested in his creation. God didn't just make this earth and then leave it. He's interested in his creation, what they're doing and what's going on. Even after they did so wickedly in the first six chapters of the Bible, and that he had to cause a flood, he's still interested in his creation. The next thing is, they are hunters of men. How do you know people are interested in people? They can't leave other people alone. They hunt men. In Genesis 10, 8 through 9, it says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. The name Nimrod means rebel. And he is the 13th from Adam. 13th. 13 is the number of rebellion. And Nimrod is king of Babylon. In Genesis 10:10 10, 10, it says, In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Calne in the land of Shinar. So these things make him a type of the Antichrist, who is also connected with Babylon, who is also connected with the number 13. And he is also obviously a rebel because he is Satan incarnate and opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. And it says Nimrod is a mighty hunter. Does this just refer to animals that he's hunting or to hunting men? Well, it's not far-fetched to say it refers to hunting men. In Ezekiel thirteen twenty-one, it says, Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Proverbs 6, 26, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Lamentations 4, 18, They hunt our steps. 
that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. Ezekiel thirteen eighteen and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people, and will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? Micah 7, 2, The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Jeremiah five twenty six. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait. As he that setteth snares, they set a trap. They catch men. Evil people are definitely interested in people. They'll hunt you down. They'll sell you. They'll kill you. There are men who lay and wait for blood. Proverbs 1, 11 through 12. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. There are men who are full of the devil. They are walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom they may devour. And so many children go missing each day. They are hunted down by wicked men. Even in a very small town next to my very small town, there were about eight men in a parking lot with several vans, standing outside of their vans with their phones, and a couple of their friends were inside trying to kidnap the children at Walmart and lure them out into the vans and drive away with them. And then they would sell those children for money. They are evil hunters. They hunt men. Notice that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And notice that phrase, before the Lord. The next two times it's used in the Bible, the phrase is also connected with evil and the number 13. For example, in Genesis 13.10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then in Genesis 13, 13, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 13 and verse 13 said that, with 13 words in the verse. And it said the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So I think there's some significance to saying that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. As it says in Genesis 10, 9, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. So someone someone said that people were saying Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord and that, you know, this shows he was the people's choice. They were all saying he was a mighty hunter. And that's like the Antichrist. He'll be the people's choice. Just like Saul was the people's choice. Genesis ten eleven. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kala. So Nineveh probably sounds familiar because that's where Jonah went to preach. You remember how in the book of Jonah he's supposed to go preach to Nineveh and he doesn't want to because he knows that that's the enemy of his people. But he ends up going anyway. Nineveh gets right. They fast and they get right and God spares them. But then he comes back and Nahum and destroys them because they didn't stay right. Genesis ten twelve through 14, And Razan between Nineveh and Kala, the same is a great city, and Mizraim begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lahabim, and Naphtuim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim, and Kaphtorim. Philistim, there is your Philistines, you know, that David fought, Goliath. And Genesis 10, 15, And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the children of Heth. Those are the ones that Abraham got his burying place from. Genesis 10, 16 through 20, And the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Havite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hamathite, afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar and to Gaza, as thou goest into Sodom and Gomorrah. There's Sodom and Gomorrah showing up again in this, in the line of Ham. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Now the sons of Shem, in Genesis 10.21, starting in Genesis 10.21, 10, you got the sons of Shem. 
Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. So Shem is in the line of Jesus Christ. And Eber would be a great, 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 great grandfather to Abraham, as you'll see in Genesis 11, 17 through 26. And Eber is where you get Hebrew. That's where you get Hebrew from. It's Eber. Genesis 10:22 through 23, the children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Mash. And Uz probably sounds familiar to you because in Job 1, 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And Genesis 10, 24 through 25, And our facts had begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber. And e unto Eber were born two sons. The name of, the, of one was Peleg. For in his, his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Some might think that the earth was divided in the sense that the continents broke off, and maybe they did at one time come apart and everything, but here it looks like it's just referring to the people. If you go by the context, because in Genesis 10:32, it says these are the families of the sons of noah after their generations in their nations and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood so it seems to be talking about the people not actually the continents then genesis 10:26 through 31 and joktan begat almodad and Shelaf and Hazar Mavith and Jira and Hadoram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abamiel and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha as thou goest unto Sefer and out of the east. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So there you have it, the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And there's a lot of names in there that you could re take time and take months researching the names and all that. Uh, the Bible's an amazing book. It just keeps going and going and going. But people are interested in people. That's why God has chapters like this. God also has chapters like this to keep a record of things and show you where did these people come from? How did we get here? But people are interested in people. The proof is they have children. Number two, they hunt each other. I mean, that right now where I'm talking, there's probably been somebody kidnapped. There's probably been somebody hunting somebody down, trying to catch them, trying to catch them in their words, trying to catch them physically. And then the, next, the last thing, we know people are interested in people because they're huddled up together all the time. And... Genesis 10.32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So God told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He didn't want them all in one spot. But people are interested in people, so they want to gather together. You see Christians today who think they should gather together with all the other religions. I even heard a Baptist King James preacher who thought it was good that the Pentecostals were gathering together in a meeting with him with Bible believers because, you know, they're all, since they're all Christians, they just need to all get together. But that's not good because their doctrine of baptismal regeneration might rub off on them. And when you have a bunch of religions and denominations gathered together, then this means that doctrine is most likely not being preached. I mean, you can shout and holler and have a good time and have a big emotional experience, and everybody's okay with that. But when you open that Bible and start to calmly explain the doctrine, that's what really makes people mad. Because then they find out what you really believe about things, and that you're not completely in agreement with them, and that makes people upset. But you'll see in chapter 11 that people are so interested in people that they gather together with each other they come together and use all their strengths people are more interested in each other than they are in god this is why espn is so popular it's all about people that people can look up to this is why the news is so popular people are interested in people what are these people doing 
over in another state that I don't even know? What are the people doing on the other side of the world that I don't even know? People are so interested in people. That's why it's not strange that God would make a chapter with a bunch of names of people. But God, you're going to see in the next chapter that God has to come down and confound their language just so that they will separate from each other. But this has been Genesis chapter 10.